Our reading is the familiar story from John, uh, 753 to 811. Jesus went to the temple and brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and making her stand before all of them, they said to him, teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now, in the law, Moses commanded, we are to stone such a woman. Now, what do you say? Well, Jesus says, let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And once again, he bent down and wrote on the ground. And when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the elders. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus straightened up and said to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, sir. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go your way, and from now on, do not sin again. A popular telling of this story has a mob ready to stone the woman. And, and by the way, Deuteronomy also prescribes the same sentence for her partner in sin, but presumably he got away. Jesus says, let anyone among you who is without sin cast the first stone. And hearing this, one by one, they slinked away. Now, isn't that a bit fishy? Here is a mob ready to stone a woman to death. And Jesus says this, and they just meekly walk away. Seems more likely that someone would have the self-righteous chutzpah to step out and throw a rock. Would it have to be, as the old joke says, that an old woman emerges from the crowd and cruelly throws a big stone, and Jesus says, Mom, stay out of this. No, they went away of their own accord, one by one, beginning with the elders, and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Well, we can certainly allow that Jesus had almost magical, extraordinary powers of persuasion like Jedi mind control. But still, these haughty people were chastened and humbled and one by one walked away. This is one of the most widely familiar stories in Christian scripture. Just about every movie in Jesus has it. Even Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ which focuses on a narrow slice of time, found a way to work it in as a flashback. <laughs> now, there is question of the authority of this passage. Biblical scholars, those old party poops, mostly believe that this passage is an interpolation, not an interpolation that is a straight line between two points like we learned in science class. A biblical interpolation is something added later on by another author or another editor. It's not just making stuff up. The Bible comes to us through 2,000 years of transcription, sometimes putting together fragments into a linear narrative. This story called the Pericope Adulteri by scholars I included it in the sermon title so that you would all know how to spell it. It appears in some old texts of John and not in others. And it has a slightly different style than what became before, what came before and after. Rivers of ink have been spilled over whether this story is original. The consensus is no. But a wider range of thought is over whether it is properly part of the canon the revealed word of God. The amateur theologian in me says absolutely. The authority of Christian scripture does not rest on it being true to some original writing, telling a story revealed to a single prophetic author. No, the authority of scripture rests on the belief that the words we read were brought to us through centuries of preservation 
transcription, translation, and yes, interpolation, the work of many all guided by the hand of God. So where does that get us? Back to the story. It's a story of mercy, but also a story of accountability and responsibility. A little historical context fills it out. This was the Roman Empire. They gave local authorities quarter to maintain local order according to local laws and customs. But the death penalty was exclusively reserved for Rome. And of course, Rome used it liberally for Rome's purposes. If a mob stones someone to death, the Roman authorities asked, who started this? Now, mob violence builds over time, people goading each other into increasing frenzy until it is lethal. And it's hard to say who started it, who did it. Jesus interrupts this process and says, let the one who is without sin cast the first stone. It calls for individual responsibility and exposes you to individual accountability. You want to stone this woman? What are you going to say to Pilate? Go ahead, do you feel lucky? Still, the reputation of the Pharisees had for strict application of Deuteronomic law makes us marvel that no one went ahead and started the mob execution that the law called for. We can find the quest for moral perfection throughout the ages, but nothing unique there. I believe the pericope adulteri, the term literally means excerpt about the adulteress, has such eternal appeal because it deals with the tension of sin and forgiveness and repentance. It is basic to any system of social control, religious or secular. A person, or rather most people, can become so burdened with guilt that a change of course appears hopeless. A kind of moral fatalism takes over. Mercy gives you a way out of this trap. And it takes away your excuse for not taking this way out. There may be earthly earthly consequences as punishment for malign behavior, but the appeal of forgiveness and repentance is that while your body, your reputation may be stained, but a clean heart and revived soul can be had to those who ask. There is mercy, there is forgiveness, but there is work to do. And doing right takes work and planning. In his autobiography, Benjamin Franklin reflects how as a young man, I'm quoting here, it was about this time that I conceived the bold and arduous prospect of arriving at moral perfection. I wished to live without committing any fault at any time. I would conquer all that either natural inclination, custom, or company might lead me into. As I knew, or I thought I knew, what was right and wrong, I did not see why I might not always choose the one and avoid the other. But I soon found out that I had undertaken a task of more difficulty than I imagined. When my attention, while my attention was taken up in guarding against one fault, I was often surprised by another. Habit took advantage of inattention. Inclination was sometimes too strong for reason. I concluded at length that the mere speculative conviction that it is in your interest to be completely virtuous was not sufficient to prevent me from slipping. And that the contrary habits must be broken and good ones acquired and established before we can have any dependence on a steady, uniform rectitude of conduct. Okay, Franklin goes on 
to enumerate a list of 13 moral virtues, the last of which is humility. He described a program to work on them, one by one, one week at a time. He kept records as if it were a formal FDA-regulated quality control program that follows the principles, say what you do, do what you say, and record what you did. He goes on page after page in an engaging account of this striving toward moral perfection. He realizes that the impossible zenith cannot be reached, but values the experience of the quest. I highly, rec I highly recommend this autobiography to any of you who haven't read it. Uh, he ends this section by observing that, in reality, there is perhaps no one of our natural passions so hard to subdue as pride. Disguise it, struggle with it, beat it down, stifle it, mortify it as much as one pleases, it is still alive and will every now and then peep out and show itself. You will see it perhaps often in this history, for even if I could conceive that I had completely overcome it, I would probably be proud of my humility. So Jesus said to the woman, go and sin no more. We don't know the rest of her story. Presumably this brush with death was a powerful lesson and deterrent, or maybe not. She might look at the ordeal and say, and say See, everybody, everybody does it. I'm, I'm not the only sinner here. We don't, have to law, law, we don't have to launch such an elaborately, uh, I'm sorry, we don't have to launch such a laughably elaborate program of moral perfectionism as Franklin did, however laudable such ambitions may be. We can fail, even grievously, and we can move on and not take our forgiveness as permission. It takes action and it takes thought. In the Synoptic Gospels, Jesus says, when an unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it wanders through waterless regions looking for a resting place but finds none. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came when it comes, it finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Then it goes and brings along seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and live there, and the last state of that person is worse than the first. Forgiveness leaves us swept out and put in order. It is empty that we must guard against. This is the fourth Sunday after Pentecost when we celebrate the gift of the Holy Spirit. We don't have to inhabit and defend our spiritual house alone, but we have to inhabit it. Jesus said, go and sin no more, but let's not forget the go part and give a little thought and prayer and planning to where we're going. It isn't okay to let our feelings immobilize us or, or our failings immobilize us. And when we fall down, get up. Accept the help of others in getting up and help up others who fail and inhabit with joy your spiritual house. You are forgiven, you are free, you are empowered, go and make a plan, amen.